Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Marcus Sauer of the University of Würzburg. And today we discuss things from the study of combustion to studying single molecules. Very, all others in, in, this, in this department have been working on combustion. And I started to focus now on biological molecules and imaging and microscopy and single molecule techniques without any knowledge. So it was a, a one-man show in a physics department, basically. Why? His winter meeting always starts at 4 p.m. just to allow for a day skiing, or is it? Uh, we are always looking forward to, to meet in Klosters every year um, for skiing and, 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 and science exchange. His attempt to get us to eat our vegetables. There are a few vegetables I don't like that much. <laughs> it's not that I hate vegetables, I eat vegetables on a daily basis. And where he thinks further research is needed. We have to find ways to efficiently label sites on proteins with super small displacement. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York and today on The Microscopist I'm joined by Marcus Sauer from the University of Würzburg over in Germany. Marcus, how are you today? Good, thank you very much. How are you? I, uh, I'm, I'm really good, thank you. And thank you so much for accepting this invitation and joining me today. I remember, <laughs> first, no, pleasure. I remember the first time hearing you talk, uh, which was at an Elmi meeting. And I was blown away uh, by your research. But I was also, what was really impressive, yeah, we read the papers, we know the research, we kind of know the field. What was really good is I'm listening, criticizing it in my head, thinking, ah, yes, but what if? And then within two slides, you had the what if. It's like, oh, he's answered it. And I'm thinking, oh, yes, but what if? Two slides later, boom, that's it. It's like, oh, my goodness. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Think, ah, yes, this all sounds great. But and then you say, oh, this might sound great, but and look at this. So actually, we can't believe it, but it really, we've done it all. And so, I, yeah, I was really taken aback by how comprehensive, how you criticised your own work and addressed it in the presentation. Uh, and that was a talk, I, I think you were counting around a, a nuclear pool and counting the rings or similar to that. Yeah, really um, good. Yeah. Uh, which was immense. So. That doesn't come naturally, that skill. So where did you start your career? What was your first degree? Where did I start my career? First degree, uh, graduate school in Pforzheim. That's a hidden city, southwest, between Stuttgart and Karlsruhe. This is where I'm growing up. And I there did my graduate school. And uh, well, um, and I, I, I graduated. 1984 and if i remember correctly i even deselected from my courses uh physics and chemistry at the end yeah so you could select courses where you would just put more focus on or less and i deselected chemistry and physics at the end because i thought it's super boring and, and on the other hand also quite complicated so i deselected that and well, but simultaneously, I was very fascinated by medicine and how it could be possible to, to manage or heal diseases, yeah, or treat cancer or find new drugs or new methods to, to help people and uh, to fight against some of these big uh, problems in medicine and things like that. And, and this is also what I, after, after I graduated, I, I also tried to, or I started actually to study medicine for two semesters for about one year and if you're studying medicine you have to work in hospitals kind of 
practical semin practic practical courses and things like that you have to do. And while I did that, uh, there was a professor, a physical chemistry professor in the hospital. And I told him about my dreams, what, what, what is fascinating me and what I would love to do later and things like that. And he told me, Marcus, if you really want to do that, what you're telling me here, you do not, you should not study medicine. <laughs> uh, you should study physics or chemistry and then develop new technologies, methods, which have a chance to be translationally applied in medicine in a way to help people and to fight against disease or to find new drugs. And this really changed my mind. It was mind blowing me. And, and I, because I always also was quite frustrated during the first two semesters of medicine because it was like a, a memorizing course. You had to learn, learn, learn. And then next day people ask you and get to remember and, and, and give exactly what you memorized. I mean, this was, also not what I aimed for. So I started then to study chemistry. And well, so this was the start of everything to start chemistry. And then after a while of studying chemistry, I was a bit bored about all these chemical formulas. So I focused more and more into the direction of physical chemistry. And then a very important step was then that I ended up in a group uh, so my PhD supervisor, Jürgen Wolfrum was his, is his name. He's still alive, uh, 80, 82 years old now, exactly. And he was doing combustion diagnostics. So he, he was using lasers and investigating uh, diesel or gasoline engines. So the, the combustion process. Yeah doing imaging of radicals which are produced during combustion and their distribution and how to optimize that and things like that. So he was one of the leading persons in the field. And, and I thought that's interesting lasers and it's imaging and it's a bit of microscopy and it's photophysics of radicals and for photochemistry. And so I started my PhD in his group. And after one year of doing PhD in his group, he came back from a trip to US where he was I think he was uh, uh, in the advisory board of the US government. That time it was, when was that? Uh, 1991, 92, something like that. They had this program to put or to develop lasers for defense system in space. Yeah, okay. I remember something <laughs> called SDI project or something, yeah? And he was on board of that. And while he was there in the US for such a meeting, uh, he, he met just by chance, I think, Dick Keller. Maybe this name doesn't tell you anything, but he was, he was at Los Alamos. He was head of the group responsible for single molecule DNA sequencing. In early times, already in the 80s, they started projects to, to develop or find ways to sequence a single DNA molecule. And he came back and told me, super fascinated about the ideas of Dick Keller, and told me, Marcus, you have to write a grant and you have to start doing research into this direction. And this was finally the beginning of my way to, I mean, I was, I was the exot, the very, all others in, in, this, in this department have been working on combustion. And I started to focus now on biological molecules and imaging and microscopy and single molecule techniques without any knowledge. So it was a, a one-man show in a physics department, basically. <laughs> I'm just going right back to the very start where you found chemistry and physics not so interesting, boring, uh, not so challenging. So you went into biomedicine. Uh, you then get told by a quite an insightful uh, medic that you should do chemistry and physics if you want to make a diff that those impacts that you wanted to do. Exactly. So not only do you go into chemistry and physics, but you find yourself in a combustion engine group, which has nothing to do with human research. Nothing at all. And then somehow you start working on DNA inside a combustion engine. <laughs> DNA. So so he pushed me to to try to find ways to to detect single molecules by fluorescence. And, and I tried to find literature and there was not much literature at that time. <laughs> so it was basically 
two or three papers from Los Alamos, from the Kellos group. They tried to do that in a flow system. Yeah. And, and then uh, there was a connection between Heidelberg, where I did my PhD, and Göttingen to, to the group of Manfred Eigen and Rudolf Riegler. And it was the same time they started to, uh, to, to, to use FCS, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, in confocal microscopes to increase the signal to background ratio to be able to detect fluctuations at the single molecule level in the fluorescence signal. And well, finally we joined forces between Göttingen and Heidelberg. And this is, was also the first time when I met Petra Schwiller then. So, because uh, so, Petra was right at the forefront of. Yeah, she was at the forefront of this FCS business with Manfred Eigen and Rudolf Riegler. And I was a one man show in Heidelberg. And for some reasons, we joined forces and, and, and I started, which was then my specialty to, to learn about the photophysics and how, of dyes and how to, to, which dye you have to use for which application and, and also things like, can you use photophysics advantageously to, to monitor interactions of dyes with biomolecules and things like that. And, this was then my speciality. Um, Marcus, actually, there, there is one question I have for you. Talking to Petra, don't you go skiing once a year with Petra? Yeah, well, um, uh, we are going skiing once a year in January. Early of January, there is a, a, a conference called the Winter Seminar. It has been originally introduced by Manfred Eigen, our Nobel laureate from Göttingen um, in the late 60s as a kind of group seminar in the Alps. I presume this isn't the group at this No, point. this isn't the group. <laughs> no, this is my group. And at the, I think it was 2008 or 2009, I have been asked whether I would like to take over and, and organize this seminar together with a colleague from Berlin. And I finally agreed to organize this seminar. And since then, the last 12 years or 11 years, I'm organizing this, this annual winter seminar in the Alps. Uh, January, it's, it's held in Switzerland, in Klosters, so close to Davos, uh, in a hotel. And there we are for 10 to 14 days every January. And Petra is coming regularly. I mean, she did her PhD already in Manfred Eigen's group. I met her there every year. I'm meeting other colleagues there every year, more or less. We always invite people from around the globe. Just oh, to wait, wait, wait. I haven't had an invite yet. It's a very private format. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do not have a web page. Uh, I mean, maybe we should do that. <laughs> so there is about 150 people coming per year, but they do not all stay for two weeks. Yeah. So I stay for two weeks. <laughs> That's good for me. <laughs> but you get loads but... of skiing in then. Yeah, exactly. I go skiing with friends, with colleagues, uh, and so on. So these are a few colleagues in the background. There, I see uh, a few colleagues from. Uh, most of them are. Oh, Michael Grohl from Munich is there, and um, Mike Heilemann from Frankfurt. I see in the background, and a few people who regularly join. Uh, the seminar, but also two older uh, <laughs> colleagues, older, sorry, um, from from Göttingen. So this is uh, what we are always looking forward to to meet in Klosters every year um, for skiing and 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 in science exchange. So it's 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 a very um, a very easy format. So we have basically two to three, four talks starting at 4 p.m. So there's enough time for skiing the whole day and um, then a few talks and, and drinks at the bar and a quite relaxed atmosphere, I have to say. So, so yeah, this for anyone who's not into conferences, most conferences are very intense periods of science. Exactly. Now you're selling this two to four hours of seminars and, and I, I, I think I can see exactly why this is a good conference and it's not because <laughs> of the skiing and it's not because of the social I'm presuming the the free the free mind talk the, the ability to think you, you have two or three big lectures 
big, you know. Exactly. They are really big. They are really big. They are one hour each uh, with uh, 15, 20, sometimes 30 minutes of discussion about it afterwards. And so, then in the bar, I'd imagine there's a lot more talk about exactly, science. And... But I mean, if you want to start a collaboration, I mean, there is nothing better than going skiing with the person for one day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is you know, in the Zoom world, uh, as we are today. Uh, it's right. great. And the existing networks are, exist. But to create networks is really tough. Absolutely. And, you know, it's a bit like any conference. It's down the bar when you're eating that you make new contacts that you can talk more freely uh, exactly. unguarded and, and come out with nonsense ideas but out of those nonsense ideas exactly. come you can also ideas. address the questions you you do usually not address after a talk uh, maybe more critical questions or, or just maybe you think your question might be too stupid so you don't ask it after the talk but you might ask after a beer or during a beer or so yeah I mean, this is the advantage of these conferences. And then I have another ski seminar in March, usually every year with my group, but only for one week, I have to say. <laughs> so, so who's the best skier? Oh, the guy oh, in the orange dress, in the orange dress. He's a professional free ride skier, but he left the group a year ago. But I learned a lot of him from him in the last five years because he's really professional doing free ride skiing. And wow, I mean, I was a good skier, but I didn't do that much free ride skiing. But thanks to him, a few members and including me, we learned free ride skiing with avalanche rucksack and everything fully equipped to do a few things which are really scary, but fascinating if you survive. <laughs> so you like your... Uh... So you like the thrill of something scary as well? Yeah, exactly. These things I really love. Not not all scary thing, things. I mean, I, there are other things I don't do. Yeah, uh, but skiing, free ride somewhere in the Alps. Um, this can be also. It doesn't have to be too dangerous. I mean, you are equipped with protectors with uh, with this um, with this avalanches on your back and things like that. So. I mean, you're not stupid, yeah, but it gives you a kind of freedom. So, and in the, so that, that's great. So you get a thrill outside of work with your skiing in the winter. What about the summer? What about the summer? Well, <laughs> motorbikes. <laughs> <I see that. laughs> you sent me this picture. I've got to say, that is an awesome looking yeah. uh, British racing green. Triumph. Yeah, exactly. British Racing Green Triumph. I mean, I, I had motorbikes when I was 18, 19 till 22 or so. I was riding motorbikes, but I never could afford to buy a Triumph. Yeah. Um, but then, I mean, I stopped motorbiking for 30 years almost or 25 years because my wife thought it's too dangerous. But then I convinced her that in order to ride in Würzburg between the different institutes without parking lot, slots, yeah, without parking places, I need a motorbike again. And finally, I could convince her to buy. First of all, I bought a smaller one, and then I could uh, realize my dream of riding a Triumph uh, special design and everything. Yeah, uh, it, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a motorcyclist, but that does look really, really gorgeous. Yeah, it's it was a special design with all special equipment and blah 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 well now i i'm not a rich person but i mean now it's much easier to realize a few dreams you had when you had been 20 years old yeah and otherwise i i love the fact that your wife didn't let you do it because it's too dangerous and after 25 years of marriage she said yeah go for it please <laughs> <laughs> no that that was not what she did what she said <laughs> But as I told you, my argument was to drive because I started several collaborations to medical doctors at the university hospital. And in order to, to commute between my institute and the university hospital, it's much easier if you either go by bike, but Würzburg is very hilly, so no way, without an e-bike at least, or you buy, the, buy a motorbike. And that, finally. That, that leads us back into work quite nicely because... Again, you started with that chemistry, physics, not liking it, then going back into chemistry, physics. 
And then you come back full cycle and now you are working with the medics, you're working up, uh, collaborating with the research. So what, what are they doing with your techniques? What, what are you bringing into them that they couldn't otherwise do? I mean, from, from it's, I mean, there have been, I don't know how many super resolution microscopy techniques developed very successfully and they, they produce impressive results in biological research like you mentioned or we talked just briefly about nuclear pop complexes to 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 unravel the the molecular architecture of multi-protein complexes and things like that but nobody nobody succeeded so far to really translate these technologies or use them advantageously in in medical sciences and and I think it started here five, six, seven years ago when I had a discussion with the director of the University Hospital uh, of, of the uh, University Hospital of Würzburg, uh, Hermann Einzele, and he had a discussion about he's using immunotherapies and he's developing immunotherapies um, to, to treat multiple myeloma and leukemia patients. He's an international expert on that. And he told me that, um, man, he told me a few stories about, so they address tumor associated antigens on the surface of these tumor cells. So they are attacked by antibodies, for example, immunotherapy with antibodies or what they do today is so-called CAR T cell therapies that they take the T cells out of your body and then they genetically manipulate the cells that they express a few binders on the surface, which are directed against these tumor associated antigens. But he told me about side effects of this therapy that some people pass, pass away under this immunotherapy and they don't know why. And people discuss about the possibility whether these receptors might also be expressed albeit at low uh, expression level on healthy cells and things like that. And this is when I thought about, okay, there we can help. We do seeing molecule sensitive imaging of tumor cells and of healthy cells and label these receptors with antibodies and tell you something about the number of these, how many receptors are expressed. And this is what we are doing now in, in, in several bigger projects together with the University Hospital here and in Berlin with Charité and other people to use this super resolution and single molecule techniques to yeah to pump a little bit, to, to try to improve this immunotherapy uh, uh, applications. I, I've got a, a question now which would be really interesting to hear is how did you find this group or how did they find you? Where did you meet? I mean the, the director of the university hospital I found here, I met here at the meeting of the university I think. I gave a talk and he gave a talk. I think there was it was just by chance. I mean, this is always chance. Just by chance, you you have to meet somewhere. You have to be open-minded. I mean, this is the major problem. The people, I mean, usually you might leave the room and grab a coffee if a medical doctor is giving a talk after you talked. Yeah. But maybe if you stay in and, and then start discussions afterwards with him and he listened to your talk, then there might be possibilities to bring this to sides together efficiently. And this is really fascinating me a lot, I have to say. So this is one side of my fascination to really use this, these technologies and these microscopes in, at, on patient samples, yeah? And the other thing is still photophysics of dyes and how to use that to, I don't know, to understand a few things, yeah? I think that's, you know, it's really important. It highlights, going back to your skiing trips and the meetings and the conferences, it does bring people together from different disciplines. Uh, there's always going to be someone who's a bit different outside the field. Right. It's, it's those meetings and the, the relaxed atmosphere that enables those connections to be made. Uh, but you're right. You stayed in. You listened to a talk that wasn't relevant on paper. Wasn't relevant. Paper. But yep. when you listen, suddenly it's like, well, actually, I can contribute to that. But if you weren't at that meeting, you wouldn't have picked up his scientific paper. I, I wouldn't. Never, have ever, it. never, ever. No, so the importance of those meetings is really nicely exemplified by how you how you met. Uh, so it's, it's quite nice that, that that came through on that. So talking about going back to the the more the more fundamental research, I had a question from earlier that I didn't ask. How much fluorescence is there inside a combustion engine? <laughs> there is a lot of fluorescence. These are radicals. 
OH radicals, nitrogen, oxygen radicals, and the distribution of these radicals tells you something about the, the, the exhaust, uh, how many uh, nitrogen gases and, and, and other gases you do not want to have today are exhausted, or how to prevent it. So is that multi that multidisciplinary approach, of, you know, just just what we can learn from physicists, the engineers, material scientists? Absolutely. This yeah, this was super multidisciplinary surrounding that time. So my colleagues, I mean, I jumped out of this combustion business pretty fast, but my colleagues they moved with lasers and and equipment to Mercedes in Stuttgart or to Peugeot in Paris in Paris, yeah, to do measurements or at their location in Paris, on their engines there, and try to tell them something, how to improve the combustion process. So this was very, very interesting, I think, but it has had nothing to do with biology or medicine. Yeah. So this, and this took me really a hard time at the beginning. I mean, imagine you're working alone in a field, and nobody else is working, nobody can help you. You can nobody ask for advice or, or help. I mean, there was then one person at uh, Karlheinz Drexhage. He was, he's now 88 years old, I think, but still alive. Um, and he was in, he lives, and he was at the University of Siegen in Germany. Uh, but he was, he did really seminal work on fluorophore development. He worked for Kodak in US, for example, and developed most of the rotor mines we know today and use today. He was, involved in the development of these dyes and many other things near field interactions he did seminal work and he was then my co-supervisor of my phd and i could learn enormous and i mean i learned all i know about fluorophores and dyes i learned from him and there is still are still people are reading if you read today old books from karl heinz Drexler of the 70s of last century and I promise you will learn a lot of things. This is, this is a secret tip. Read the very old papers of Karl-Heinz Drexhage. And you, you will learn everything about triplet states and quantum yields and why the quantum yield is higher for this die or lower for that die and quenching processes and possibilities for quenching. This is really fascinating. I could learn a lot from him. So now I have to go back and read that. Which yeah. is the third promise I've made on these podcasts. I think I promised uh, Richard Henderson that I watched Breaking Bad, and I've started uh, Elizabeth Hillman. I promised I'd clean my oven, and I, I've done that. That's ticked off now. Cool. Uh, Very so, cool. Yeah. So now I've got to read more about fluorescence. I, I thought my fluorescence was pretty good, but actually, I would love to get deeper with it. So I, I will take you up on that. I will go. For yeah. it. So my next question is: What was the first microscope you used? Yeah, well, the first microscope was a microscope I built myself during my PhD. I mean, the, my, my idea had been, or I was told to detect the fluorescence of a single molecule. And there was no paper published about that by confocal microscopy or what, what is standard today or wide field microscopy. I mean, the, I found an avalanche photodiode in the lab, uh, an objective, uh, a water immersion objective with a high NA. And so I, Put a drop of water with dyes diluted to 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 11 molar, put it onto the objective lens, uh, place the avalanche photodiode in the imaging plane of the oven of the objective, and yep. then irradiate it from the side with a lens. I focused the laser into the droplet, into the water droplet. And I saw on the APD some fluctuations. And I didn't know what it is, but it was my first single molecule signals. I'm pretty sure. Did you just invent the fluorimeter? <laughs> <laughs> then, with, I mean, with a higher lens. Yeah, but then due to the cooperation with Göttingen, we learned from Rudolf Riegler uh, that you should better take a confocal microscope. So the confocal principle. And I mean, we immediately, I immediately tried that and worked out much better. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so but the, I, I will never forget these times when we aligned the first confocal microscopes to detect single molecule signals while, while they transfer through the laser 
while they pass through the laser focus. And we were sitting until 5 a.m. in the morning in front of our monitors and seeing some fluctuating signals, but you never knew what is it. Is this the signature of single molecules or not? I mean, and then you tried to sleep and you closed your eyes and you still saw all these fluctuating signals. <laughs> it was, and today it's so easy. It's so <laughs> super easy today. Yeah. Yeah, but don't you miss it? From that, time that, to time, I'm missing it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I haven't been in the lab for 10 years or so. I, I would destroy everything probably or misalign or I don't know. <laughs> it's just. But that unknown, you know, not knowing what the signals even mean and proving it, that, that's. Yeah, like you can dilute it or increase the concentration and dilute the concentration. Yeah, sure, sure. That's easy. I mean, for example, I think we, I'm pretty sure that we monitored and recorded for weeks the signal impurities in the oil of an oil immersion objective. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Oops. without knowing it. I'm pretty sure many, many, many scientists did that in the early years. Uh. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, Move, moving on. So that was your early days, but obviously you've made significant impacts moving forward. <clears throat> I, I, I will dare to say maybe D-Storm being one of the biggest. Ah, impacts. well, it was. to differ, so. Yeah, but this was, this was a, a difficult story. D-Storm was really a difficult story. I mean, I, I was in the years of, 2000 to 2005, my work mainly focused on photophysics of dyes at the single molecule level to investigate fluorophore interactions and blinking behavior of dyes. And with the aim to use it maybe at the end for data storage at the single molecule level. So these have been the things we have been dreaming of, yeah. And then we discovered just by chance that this carbocyanin dyes Psi 5 um, and Alexa 647, um, that they show this kind of addressable, reversible blinking in some weird buffers. But these buffers were not that weird. I mean, there have been papers published in Nature already 1990, 88 or something, already by, by, uh, by Yanagida, uh, a Japanese scientist. He was very popular and famous in. Uh, in the last century for his work on ATP uh, single molecule rotation measurements and tracking of myosin molecules and things like that. So he, he did the single, first single molecule measurements and he always used the cyanine dyes in order to improve the photostability. He used uh, thiols, mercaptoethylamine or mercaptoethanol. Yep. So he introduced that. And then there came the time of uh, single pair thread measurements. So this was the time of Shimon Weiss and Tech Chipha. Um, when I was at, in Shimon's lab, I was there in 1997. It was just the last few months of Tech Chipha in his lab. So we had an overlap of a few months there. I will never forget. And there we did this first single molecule um, thread experiments. And there people also used this mercaptoethylamine or mercaptoethanol buffers. And from time to time, people reported then afterwards that they saw a strange behavior in the fret efficiency. So that the fret efficiency seems to be high and then it drops for a few seconds to zero. And then it recover back. Or it disappears completely and then it recovers back if you monitor trajectories of single immobilized fluorophores. And this we, 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 we thought about, let's investigate this in more detail. And this is how we discovered that these dyes can be reversibly photo switched by means of light and thiol buffer between on and off. And then we published this, but not for localization microscopy, just for, I mean, just for scientific reasons. I mean, this is maybe a way to, 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 to do data storage at the single molecule level, on, off. Yep. Yeah. And it, in the same, when we published this paper, uh, uh, we sent it to science, but they rejected it. And it ended up then, in JAX anyway, and in the same week when this paper appeared in JAX, there was this, this other paper from Howard, uh, which appeared in PRL. And they discovered exactly the same and they described the identical results. The only difference was we published this for Sci-5, how Sci-5 can be switched. And the other PRL paper uh, published that 
a green fluorophore activator is required in order to get psi five switched. So, okay, we thought about, okay, no explanation for that, why? Maybe they also listened to this talk of these FRED people and they just took the FRED pair to investigate this in more detail. Yeah, I mean, this would make sense to me yeah. anyway. And then of course it was the, 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 the work of Harvard and Shawai and, and the people in Harvard to then use it for the first time advantageously for storm microscopy. There is no question this was their, uh, their work and, 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 and justified, fully justified, yeah, everything. But I, I met then in these years Shawai several times and I told her, I mean, it's much easier. Why you do not have to, to use this activator Shawai? Why are you using it? I mean, we published this in the same week in another journal, yeah, that they were ignorant. I don't know, it was kind of ignorance. No, no, we do this complicated labeling of antibodies with the green and the red dye. And this pushed us to the point that we said, meanwhile, I, I'm grateful for that. Then we said, okay, then we publish our own work. And in order to honor this work of Harvard, we didn't give it another acronym. We just added the D because yeah. we thought that's quite fair considering these two papers, which appeared simultaneously. But this brought me a lot of problems with Harvard. I mean, this is, was not so nice that the following years then because of this fight between uh, D storm and storm and anyway, but we all survived. But from an end user perspective. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that, that has always been, been my argument, but well, it was delicate. The discussions have been delicate that time. No, it's interesting to hear that the politics, uh, you know, you're not in the same groups. You're, you know, no. you'd be competing scientists, but you, ah, still, but... Respect, you still talk to them. You, you didn't do it without their knowledge, hey, <laughs> you know, you we, passed we the thought knowledge. We are thieves. We, 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 we took a technique developed by others, but this was not the truth. I mean, uh, palm uh, microscopy or photoactivated localization microscopy has been invented at the same time, much earlier, um, if you have a look into the submission dates of these papers. but. Anyway, I mean, meanwhile, everything is super relaxed and cool. But the first years after that, because there was a rush, it was clear that there might be a Nobel Prize given for, into this direction. Yep. It was not so nice, the situations in meetings. Yeah. Hmm. There were fights. There were fights. It was the time when fights started between Eric Betzig, Stefan Hell, Shawai, and me. And there were everybody tried to claim something. Yeah. It was interesting. I, I think the field. I, I think it's amazing for people who are, are not familiar to see that these politics and, and they were fights, they were, they were quite public fights yeah, uh, yeah. That, that were going on. I, I think that's less so the case today. Uh, I think the field is more collegiate, maybe. And, and when it was good, I'm really happy for the fact that the Nobel Prize has been given. I was in the first, for, for super resolution microscopy in the first, second, I was really shocked about it. I thought, oh, that's too early. Yeah, it's much too early. What happened? Yeah, uh, but finally, I think it was a good thing because because it made super resolution microscopy even more prominent and known. And so we also profited from took it. Yeah, it helped. Yeah, and I think putting the lecture at the start of storm has been followed many times over now by different techniques. Putting adding letters to to the the original acronym. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, this was. Yeah, this was. <laughs> Uh, single molecule active control microscopy lobster. I remember a few of these acronyms. <laughs> Very cool. It was really cool time, <laughs> I have to say. Um, yeah, but I mean, a very powerful technique at the end, but was then DNA paint, I have to say. This is very powerful. I mean, yeah. Although restricted to turf microscopy, but it's super powerful and it definitely achieves a higher resolution than these storm technologies. Uh, and then let's see where the future goes, because those, uh, as with most of these techniques, they were limited in one plane or a small defined space, and it opens up over time. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned as well that you, you you sent it to Science, and then so you went to Jacks, which which is a very good journal, but you know obviously it it is a high very high impacting publication in the longer term. Uh, <laughs> 
How easy do you find it publishing? This is still, uh, still something I do not completely understand. I mean, from time to time, I mean, just historically speaking, in my last 20, 25 years, when I wrote a paper and I was super fascinated and thought, this is science of nature, it never ended up there. It never ended up there. I got it immediately back um, with the editor's opinion. This is not new. This is boring. This is what whatsoever, yeah. Um, but others, other papers where, where I personally thought, well, it's, it's good, but you could publish it in a nature journal, yeah, without any problems. So this is unpredictable. This is super unpredictable. It depends on the personal opinion of the editors. And then, of course, on the reviewers. Um, but I, I think I do not have to complain. I, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's not a lottery, but it, it is. It's not a lottery. No, I, exactly. I, I, this is not what I wanted to say, that it's a lottery, but um, good. But there is luck. But, yeah. yeah. Right place, right time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right there's also, Yeah, there's also a saying that says, if you publish really excellent work in a lower impact journal, it will be seen by everybody as well and will be uh, referenced. Yeah. And I think increasingly so, it, it, it's easier and easier to, to, it doesn't matter, to a degree, it's less important where it is published today. But I think university people still pride themselves on, on where it gets published. Yeah. yeah. And I think that aspiration is good because it keeps people competitive. It right. makes their sites be as excellent and as adventurous and as impactful as possible. So it's not a bad thing. Uh, so Rita Strack, uh, one of the podcasts, uh, talked really nicely about nature methods and the challenges of saying no or accepting it and the fun and the, and the, the hard. From their side, it's pretty tough. It's you know, super tough. To no. So, 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 so I, I know Rita well. They are to say very well, but I mean, we are in contact from time to time. And, and I mean, it's, I see that they are doing really a complicated job, yeah, which gives them a hard time sometimes to reject papers. Um, um, yeah, no, I, I, I always accepted these decisions. So, so what is your favorite publication that you've ever authored or co-authored? Well, this is very difficult, but I think I'm, I'm still fascinated by photophysics of dyes, and there have been some photophysics papers uh, which we published in the years 2000 to 2005, including this first photo switching paper of Sci-5, which I'm still, I think these were, were the best papers uh, uh, published from my group. Uh, personal opinion, of course, personal opinion. Yeah. The, Deastone, the Deastone things are, are nice, super nice, yeah, but um, for example, what I'm really, um, I'm not angry about it, but I mean, the, the nuclear pore complexes, um, we published the first paper on D-storm on nuclear pore complexes, 2011 or 2012. And it was really nice, fantastic images we produced about the eightfold symmetry of this nuclear pore complex, uh, wonderful. But I didn't even submit the work to science or nature. I thought, I mean, there is nothing new, we learn zero, nothing. So let's submit it to a medium impact journal. And it was kind of strange to see afterwards that people could publish nuclear pore complexes two years later by storm D storm in science. So this was then frustrating, not only me, mainly my students who did the work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because of course it makes a big difference to their future careers, you know, Exactly. For them, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem and they are suffering uh, from these rejection things. And, and I mean, there are also papers you, 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 you fight to publish for two years. You send it from journal to journal. And, and I'm used to that, or we all experienced scientists are all used to that, but for, but for PhD students, I mean, this is clearly frustrating them. I'm going to try some uh, quick, quick fire questions. Okay, so. Uh, what's your pet hate in life? You can't say podcasts. 
No. No. Hate. Um, if people are don't telling you the truth, <laughs> if they just uh, tell you only the, the positive uh, sides of stories, um, just in order to, to, to receive more attention, or I don't know, to get for scientists to get people uh, to get papers sooner published or more efficiently published, uh, but which which are finally of no help for the audience or for, for the community um, yeah. because pff, useless. <laughs> Nobody can cook it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is what I really hate. Things like that. Um, okay. What is your what is the your favorite item that you own? Oh, quick fire. <laughs> Motorbike? <laughs> I, <didn't know> any. <laughs> I, I, I had a feeling you'd say you're trying. <laughs> I yeah. uh, what's your favorite food? Uh, fish. Ooh. What's your least favorite food? Mm. There are a few vegetables I don't like that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I hate vegetables. I eat vegetables on a daily basis. Even I, I you sound like a small child. Love your meat. Don't want my vegetables. No salad. No salad. <laughs> want to ride my motorbike. <laughs> no, no, no. That, 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 that might give the wrong impression. So I, from time to time, I even eat vegetarian. But there are a few things I don't like that much. <laughs> I am joking. Uh, beer or wine? Wine. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, this, oh, yeah, you, you see, this picture if it's wine. so this is wine in my hands. So this is, I mean, I'm not a Bavarian. I'm not a Bavarian, but I'm, I'm, I'm at the University of Würzburg and Würzburg is North Bavaria. And there are these festivals every year uh, where people wear, even students, they wear these typical Bavarian things like lederhosen and dundel women, yeah? And we are doing that then from time to time with the group to go for an evening into such a beer tent uh, directly translated and try to have some fun. But you see that I'm drinking wine. <laughs> if you carefully look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is beer? That's beer, isn't it? Oh, then, then I, then it's. I thought you've got a large glass of white wine. <laughs> I don't know, but maybe it's, it's a, no, it looks like white wine to me. On the left, it's water, the two girls and Mine, I think, uh, I don't know. But I prefer definitely wine. Okay. If I had too much beer in my life. Would you rather read a book or watch TV? Oh, I read a real non-scientific book. I read maybe once a year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and uh, TV, I also do not watch TV that often. Maybe I turn on TV at 11 p.m. or 11.30 and watch the news and maybe just I'm scraping through the program. So that's what I'm typically doing. Sports, of course. Soccer, I like. Yeah, so who's your football team? Mm -hmm. So who do you support? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. No. No. No favorite football team? If if maybe Bayern München, maybe. Okay. But usually I try to be uh, to be uh, objective, yeah. As long as long as you can. I mean, of course, at the European Soccer Tournament or the World Championship, I'm for the German team. But I mean, the last two few years it was a disaster. So, <laughs> yeah, well, as a Brit. We know what that feels like <laughs> for many years. I mean, this was a pity. This was a pity. I mean, this was, I'm so sorry for that. <laughs> we, we it was so it. deserved. It was so deserved that you won against Germany. It was the most deserved win I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah but, but I've got to say, Italy were very good winners of the Euro 2020. Yeah, yeah they, okay. They were also good. Let's say they were also good. By the way, we are still, I'm still playing soccer. I, uh, once a week, we are playing soccer at 8 a.m. in the morning from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. with my students. I don't have a picture of that. No. Sorry. <laughs> I don't have a picture of you playing football. And we, we, we usually don't take pictures when we play soccer. I mean, yeah, okay. I in, in today's selfie 
quelled. I'm surprised no, that my... students aren't already there. Well, that's right. All right. Okay. So next, Elmi. We'll have you on the team at Elmi. Okay. At Elmi, there's always a football game uh, pre pre Congress. So. Uh, Perfect. I mean, academia really... versus the uh, commercial companies. So, okay. It's good fun. It is good fun. Uh, what about music? What do you like listening to? Oh, mixed. Sometimes classical music. Uh, from time to time, classical music, but usually I, I hear radio, the radio station. The okay. Typical no. pop songs here. Okay, so popular music. I mean, I, 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 I was with hard rock like status quo and 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 whatsoever. Yeah, um, um, ZZ Top and <laughs> maybe if you if you if this tells you something, ACDC as well. But today, I, and you said status quo. Status quo as well, but in the early days when I was 15 years old, 14 years old, something, yeah. I, I think rates afterwards. I, I think this is your you grandchild. Know, that's my grandchild, yes, exactly. In my office, uh, Jolie, um, see, she's now 11 months old and she's really the, the pride and joy I, I had, even though I was, I was, I was. <sighs> Not angry, but I was. It was a, a kind of strange feeling to hear that you're gonna get be grandpa now, and I mean, you don't feel like a grandpa, yeah. So in the first moment, it was not a shock, but it was like, mm, how will I handle this situation if somebody is calling me grandpa? But finally, I mean, it's we are real super happy with her. This is... And I'm sure she'll be super proud of you, except for confessing you like status quo. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. I mean, this was when I was 14. <laughs> when I was 14. So later on, it was Deep Purple, rather. Uh, I wish you'd never... So I've got the song... I've got some of the status quo songs going in my head now. Which no, is stop it. Stop it. To concentrate stop, it. On. Ah. stop it. Stop it. Are you a night owl or early bird? Uh, depending. Uh, but I would say rather early bird. Okay. And... Who are, who's been your inspirations inside and outside of work? Inside of work, my inspiration is discuss, discussion with a few people who are, I mean, I'm a trained chemist, yeah? Um, I love to, to discuss my opinion of things then with biologists on the one hand side and with physicists, what I call hardcore physicists on the other side, because this is quite inspiring me because they have a completely different view than I have on many things. Yeah, so this is in work. And at best case scenario, we do that with a bottle of wine. Um, outside, family, friends, um, sports. I'm, I mean, the best ideas come when you go jogging after 20, 30 minutes. We, we talked, I, I guess, we talked about some of the most challenging times through before the Nobel Prize was awarded and the difficulty with peers at conferences and the fights. Uh, so I, I'm presuming that's one of the most challenging times you've had. But what about the most fun time in work? What, what part of your career, if you could relive a moment in your career, which moment would it be? It would be the moment when we started to, to try to detect single molecule fluorescence. I mean, we, I, I lively remember a time where we joined forces, three postdocs, we, what, three German postdocs, Klaus Seidel, maybe you know Klaus Seidel from Düsseldorf. No, okay, there was Klaus Seidel and Christoph Zander and me, and we met, it was 96, that time 95, 96, we met always in Göttingen at the Max Planck Institute for two or three weeks, and then we worked day and night day and night. I had an avalanche photodiode, Klaus in Göttingen had a Tysaf laser, the other guy had a, uh, an oil immersion objective and was an expert in alignment of lasers. So we always, we joined forces and we worked about 20 hours every day and we had so much fun, even though we detected only the impurities in the oil, but <laughs> it was so much fun in these nights trying to detect the signals. I told you you'd missed that uh, time. Earlier on, I said, <laughs> bet you missed being back in the lab. And <laughs> that, that moment, that, that period as well of that, that innovation, the uncertainty of it. Uh, we, we are coming up to an hour mark, I think. Uh, 
I have a question for you. Where do you, where do you see the future going? What do you think is the next big thing that has to be solved, the next big challenge? What's the next big technology that needs to be uh, I mean, that's, uh, this is from my point of view, but I think what is, what is needed now is a technology which allows you, I mean, in the, in the last two years, uh, super resolution microscopy developed into a direction that uh, higher, faster, further push the localization precision down to a few nanometers. But I mean, this cannot be translated in spatial resolution at the end of the day, because we do not have the labeling technologies. We do not have the, uh, it's not efficient enough. The, the detection probability is not high enough and things like that. So we will always end up in a diluted signal and therefore never be able to achieve real sub 10 nanometer resolution uh, in a biological sample. So I think we have to find ways to efficiently label sites on proteins with super small displacement. So there is this way of unnatural amino acids, for example, to introduce them. But the other thing is um, to find ways that in allow standard labs, buying a standard microscope, from a company or commercial microscope to achieve three colors, 3D, 20, 30 nanometer in biological samples. They're getting there slowly. Yeah. And I think the way to do that is by combining the technology we already have with expansion microscopy. So this is what I'm, I bet, or I'm sure it will be realized sooner or later for everybody. Okay. But then we want to do it in a live scenario. And actually, I was a bit cool. Of course, not live. Of course, not live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I said we're getting there slowly. I think that's a bit harsh of me, actually. I think at the, at the pace over all the time, actually, I think microscopy's had has been ex extremely fast moving over the past twenty or so years. Uh, but yeah, we st we still want it live. I think as well. Uh, for which expansion won't tick that box yet. But actually, my student actually today is playing with expansion microscopy. So uh, I look forward to seeing how that's I'm, going. I'm focusing a lot on expansion microscopy in the moment. I'm, I am mean, I have now what is called a synergy grant running from the ERC on expansion microscopy together with Ed Boyden and Silvio Rizzoli from Göttingen um, to push expansion microscopy really to the molecular level. We'll see. Which what we can achieve, but um, but this is of course not life. I mean, live cell. I think it's super fascinating. Lattice light sheet methods. Um, they made a real change to me, um, and we also set up a lattice light sheet. So we 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 used the um, in principle we had, we, we built the same system. Eric um, published in the science paper, but there are also now companies on the market. They sell quite reliable light sheet microscopes. Um, and, uh, and on the invert as well. <clears throat> so again, it overcomes some of those problems with the- Exactly, sample light. preparation, sample preparation, because this is a nightmare. This is the pain in the neck to, to, to place all the samples on these tiny cover slips and then move them somewhere in. And uh, this is, um, well, but this is overcome now. And this has been overcome now by these inverted lattice light sheet microscopes. I did measurements on it. I don't have one in my lab, but. I did measurements on it, and I have to say I was quite impressed by the speed. Uh, but then the next problem comes with data handling. I mean, this sheer size of these terabytes. Uh, but, but we share those problems with the, the structural bioEM microscopists and yeah, yeah, for sure. The genomic fields, the metabolome, the mass spec field. It's yeah, this these is right. problems are short term because computing is always is going faster than us. So I think yeah. those file size. But size of the files would have been very problematic as they were for confocal back in the early 90s. Uh, you know, the files have got so much bigger but so has storage, thank you. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Marcus, we are on the hour. So I'm gonna say thank you very much for joining us. I've got to say, it's been a real pleasure. You summarized actually a lot of previous guests. <laughs> uh, you, you chimed really nicely with a lot of things that have been said from a lot of the different guests in the previous podcast, which has been really nice. 
So thank you once more for agreeing and joining. And I love the pictures. Uh, thank you everyone for watching and listening. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channels and go back and go, go and listen to Petra Schriller herself talk about it. Go and listen to Eric Betsy talk about Lattice Light Sheet. Uh, yeah, there's so many people with very similar, uh, but different aspects, different angles and different viewpoints. Marcus, thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it, <laughs> especially the atmosphere. Thank you so much. Thanks. If you enjoyed today's episode of the Microscopies, check out some of the previous ones featuring some of Marcus's colleagues and friends, including Petra Schwiller, who he skis with, who discusses work-life balance. You get a bit addicted to having kids. When you have the first, then you want the next. And the episode with Nobel Laureate Eric Betzig, who covers the challenges in his career. I was an abject failure up to about age 45, okay? So I faced a lot of, you know, when I was 45, I think there's an alternative universe close to here in which I'm an unemployed, divorced, mechanical engineer living in Michigan. While well, Richard Henderson discusses the perils of the Scottish winter. Then it, it turns out riding a motorbike or a scooter in Scotland in the winter. <laughs> yeah, it's not very it, clever, it's is it? It's a dangerous thing, actually. And listen to Elizabeth Hillman chat about her favourite publication. It was like totally out there and it was a real struggle as well to get that, you know, published and then a real sort of delight to have a lot of people come and be like, oh my gosh, you know, you, how, where, where did you come from and how did you discover this? Visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the hyphen microscopists to watch or listen to all these episodes really some truly inspiring stories, facts to learn about. Thank you.